doing church's choice in the missions. The only thing we got left on our mission goal is our birthday present for Jesus. Sunday before Christmas when the Gideons come. Open your Bibles with me to uh, Romans chapter 13 this morning. Romans chapter 13. Reading verse 1 through 7 from Romans 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. This is talking about the secular government. For there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, or the authority, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or judgment. For the, the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power or the authority? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he's the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, or the policeman with the 45 would be the equivalent of today. <laughs> For he's the minister or the servant of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for your conscience sake. For this cause pay your tribute, pay your taxes also, for, for they're God's ministers. We're, you never really think of it that way when you're paying the income tax and property tax, but it's going out. It's it's doing a supporting a ministry of God too, the secular government, for they're God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tributes due, custom to whom customs. All taxes here for us, fear to whom fear, and honor or respect unto whom honor. Let's pray, Lord. We thank you for this uh, interesting section here from Romans 13 that how. Uh, um, you use the secular government along with the church to do a different function. In Christ's name we pray for our, our nation and the blessing on all. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So uh, this week, earlier in the week, I was watching a, well, a, a show that I used to watch when I was a kid. Do you, you do that? I got back to where I, I love to watch the shows that I've watched for 50 or 60 years, even though I've got them memorized. They ain't nothing beats Andy Griffith. And Gunsmoke and Bonanza and Twilight Zone. <laughs> I watch all those old shows. And uh, I've I got some channel I notice uh, at 8 o'clock every, every weeknight, six nights a week, it actually starts tonight and then runs every night but Saturday, they run the old Star Treks. And man, in the 60s, uh, I remember I'd, I liked to go over to Mamaw's house, and Star Trek probably just came on once a week then, but Uncle Marty, he was hooked on Star Trek. And he's 10 years older than me, so whatever he liked, I liked. So we, we couldn't wait for Star Trek to come on. We'd sit down there and watch that old black and white TV. So I'm watching them again, but now they're in color. I don't know if they were back then. Maybe we just had a black and white TV, or maybe they colorized them. But I watched the one this week that I thought, man, that's, that's pretty good because you can watch them at five or six years old and then watch them again, you know, 50, 60 years later. And, and you see everything on a deeper level than you saw back then. That's the way things work, you know. So the one this week was pretty good. Uh, Captain Kirk, what's his name? Uh, Chat William Shatner, which now I look at it and I think, you know, he was way too young to ever make that high of a rank to be capt captain of a starship. <laughs> But, but the Starship Enterprise, they were going into a, a galaxy uh, far, far away, you know, in the, the, the last frontier space. But this particular planet that they were going to visit had been visited by somebody from Earth uh, centuries, two or three, four centuries before they've gone back to check on them. Well, the, the people that were there before, the spaceship that was there before, it had met these, this civilization, and they had inadvertently left a book behind. Now, it, it was just uh, something that, you know, somebody was reading and they didn't mean to let, but because they left this book behind, it contaminated that society. And the book was, uh, in the show, the book was uh, had been written like in 1992, which was still in the future when they made the show. 
and it was about the 1920s gangs of Chicago. So when the Enterprise goes back, this whole society, they have revered this book and they've built their society on this book and everybody's running around with the gangster hats and clothes on and machine guns and there's different factions and everybody's pretty boy Floyd and they drive by and they're shooting one another and everything because they've built their entire society upon this book that they thought was a sacred book. Now, I would have never got this in when I was a kid watching it, but now I look at it and I see the parallel between our planet and God left us a book behind. Amen. The Bible, you know, and, and God expected us to, to build our society upon this book that we call His Word, His Holy, Holy Bible. And you, you look at it and you say, well, the, the society that God portrays in this book is the society that God expects us to have here on, on planet Earth. But the farther away from this book you get, the less society looks like the kingdom of God. And God gives us this book because he says, this is what my kingdom is supposed to look like. And now we look at it around today, and as time goes on, we get farther and farther down through the corridors of time. We begin to look and you say, you know, it, it seems, well, I don't know, maybe it's always this way. God's people sure was a minority in Noah's day, weren't they? <laughs> And in the first century, you look at the, at the society that they were living in that day, and you say, man, it sure was a, a society that was antagonistic toward the Christians. They were burning Christians at the stake. And uh, I got tickled yesterday. Uh, my niece put on Facebook, and uh, <clears throat> she had been to one of the, had all those kids out, and she had been to one of the, the shopping centers or something. And she said a couple of guys came around on each side of the car. Of course, it scared her to death. And then she said to, she realized they was giving out Bible tracts. And it scared her so much, she's like, uh, they could get shot doing that. You know, here I am, a single, uh, or a mom out there by myself with these kids. You know? And I told her, I said, uh, you have a valid point. I said, but I'm pretty sure that you would have shot the Apostle Paul. <laughs> no. And I said, but you know what? I said, judging from the court system in the book of Acts, I'm pretty sure they would have said it was justifiable homicide. <laughs> but we live in a society that, uh, that we look at the book and we realize that, hey, there's two societies always going on at the same time. We, we talk about there's, a, you know, even in our own country here, we say there's two Americas, and we usually say that and think of it as in political spectrum kind of way. But really, there's always two, two Americas and two whatever part of the country or the world you're in. There's going to be two different groups because you've got a Christian group, and then you've got the, the other groups that are non-Christian groups, whatever they are. I guess you saw the thing with the Olympic ceremony where the drag queens were making a mockery out of uh, the Lord's Supper. Amen. You know, it's not just in America, it's all over the world. And uh, I, I, as soon as I saw that, I didn't watch it, but I saw it, you know, it popped up later. And I thought, well, you know, here, here's something. That, the first thing popped in my head, I thought, what if they had made a mockery out of Islam like that? There'd be a hole over there today. <laughs> and my point is, there's a difference in the religions. We recognize that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we're in a spiritual battle. And you see, that's the spiritual battle that's going on. Why does that even appeal to them if that's not a, a declaration of war against the kingdom of God? But yes, we live in a world where there's always two societies. There's, there's Christian and then there's pagan. That's what it boils down to, whatever the religions are. They're non-Christian. The Christians would say those are, are pagans. That's what the Bible teaches. There's just one true religion. That's Christianity. And everything else is something else. It's, it all boils down to the part of, of paganism. And when you live in a society that's full of paganism, you think, well, it, it is perfectly understandable how we get people who, uh, who would defend something as, as killing babies and say anybody that says anything against it, they're bad guys. And the pagan would say, you can't tell that woman what she can do with her body. But the Christian would say, we're not telling the woman what she can do with her body. We're sorry that that baby may inconvenience her, but somebody's got to stand up for that innocent child and say, that's wrong to kill that baby. 
There's never been a child conceived that couldn't feel the pain when they were ripping it apart piece by piece to pull it out of its mother's womb. It's been 10 or 15 years ago, I remember going to a pro-life rally up here at Bradley High School, and the keynote speaker was this young girl. She was 18, 20 years old or so, did a fantastic job. But when you looked at her, her whole, looked like she'd been in a house fire. Her whole face was melted and her neck and everything. She was terribly burned. Every bit of skin you could see looked like that. And the reason she was a speaker is because her mama had tried to abort her and she survived a saline abortion that burned her up like that. But we live in a society where people say that's a good thing and anybody that's against that is attacking us. Yes, we are. Not physically, but as Christians, we're attacking you spiritually and standing up saying that's morally wrong and the Bible's always on the side of life. And the Bible always condemns that, whether it's Molech or Pharaoh of the Old Testament or Herod in the New. I remember 30-something years ago, I showed, a, I guess it's VCR back then up at Piney Church, and a, I showed that movie that was popular in the churches back then, Silent Scream. And in that movie, Silent Scream, it was when, I guess, ultrasound was cutting-edge technology, and they were showing that little baby in that mama's womb when they put that instrument in there, it would actually run away from it, and you could see its mouth open when they touched it in a silent scream. But see, 40 years ago, it was easy to convince people that that's just a blob. But man, you can't convince anybody of that anymore. The devil still says that, but I've been... I, I've seen too many of these young people here at church, you know, over the years that come showing up and you might not even know that they're pregnant. And some little old girl said, do you want to see my baby pictures? And they've got them on their phone or something. It's an ultrasound. And you say, yep, I can tell it's a boy. It ain't a blob, it's a boy. <laughs> you, you can see that anymore. So it, I don't know why people still use that line because nobody's going to going to believe that one. Uh, it's a, it's a child that's conceived and it's an innocent life, and and God says it's made in My image. That's why the devil hates it so bad. But the pagan society says if you talk against that, you're evil. You're wicked. We're doing good stuff. <laughs> you're wicked. The pagan society says sodomy's a good thing. If you say anything against it, they say, well, you're, you're the evil one. And you say, well, we sure are split in this country about things like that today, aren't we? And you say, how in the world did we get here? Because we moved away from the book. We moved away from the book that's a portrait of what the kingdom of God is supposed to be like. The scriptures we read today in Romans 13 is about the secular government and how the Bible teaches that the secular government and the church is not supposed to be in opposition. It's supposed to be two different things, it looks like, in the New Testament, but they're working together to, to uh, serve God. They're ministers of Christ. Even the policemen and the, and the politicians and the lawmakers, they, they should be ministers of Christ to serve God. I look at it as the government is, should be biblically considered as the enforcement arm of the church. Where do we get our ideas what's wrong and what's right? It comes from this book still. It's in a Judeo-Christian society based in the Ten Commandments. God says murder's wrong. Society says murder's wrong. There's some things that this book says that wrong that the government now has said that's right, so even they're departing from the book, and they're supposed to be prosecuting these criminals against God and crimes against God and crimes against nature, but that we've left that somewhere now. But then you'll hear people, they'll say, uh, well, we've got, a, a, a clo we, we've got separation of church and state. And when they say that, they want to say, well, you've got the church, you can do whatever you want to do in the church, but leave us alone because the government's going to run the rest of the world. Our founding fathers never meant that. I promise you they never meant that. Our founding fathers said this society will fail if people forget about God and his Bible. What they're talking about with separation of church and state, and you may not know this, they hope you don't, they think they're quoting something from the Constitution of the United States, but it ain't in there. You will not find that clause in the Constitution. The phrase separation of church and state came from a letter 
from Thomas Jefferson that a lady had written him and she was concerned that the government was going to tell their church what to do and he was assuring her that we've got a clear separation of church and state. The government's not going to do that. What the people are talking about today in separation of church and state is the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. And in the First Amendment's Establishment Clause, and everybody ought to learn this, this line right here. It says that government shall establish no religion. That's the only separation of church and state that's in there. You see, they were big on that because they had come from England when, go when the government said everybody's got to be a Catholic or everybody's got to be, depending on which king was in power, right? So they came over here for freedom of religion, not freedom from religion that some people think it is today. They came for the freedom of the religion, and this clause went in there that said government can't establish a religion. The clause means that the government can't tell the church what to do. The devil's turned it right around backwards and says, well, that means that the church has no voice about the government. No, it's to protect the church from the government, not, not the other way around. So how does the church tell the government what to do? The only voice we got is the same voice of every other Christian in, in, in America or every other pagan in America. The only voice we got is the voice of our vote. And we vote. And I said before, I said, you've got to make up your own mind which group of sinners will most protect your Christian values, right? And vote for them. Because see, you're not a Christian and something. You are a Christian and everything else is saturated with your Christianity. You're a, you're a Christian and everything else that you do and you are is submitted to the Lordship of Christ through His Word. That's what being a Christian is all about. That's what saying Jesus is Lord is all about. So we, we vote our Christian consciences as the church should. Everybody else does, church should too. But what if we lose? Well, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, but guess what? If we lose, there's no president or no governor nor no mayor nor nobody else that's ever going to be our king. Our king is Jesus. His kingdom's not of this world. We want this world to look like his kingdom, but his kingdom is his church. He's our Lord. That's higher than any other thing in the world. And I think where Christianity often jumps the track today is people on both sides, they get so upset and so, so uh, tore up and so zealous and everything, and they're so focused on which guy's going to be in the White House that they completely forget about, hey, Jesus is Lord. You take, keep, take that zealousness and that, that fire and that passion and, and give that to Jesus instead of some politician. Now, you need to vote, but uh, me and Doyle's talking about this morning. He, he's, he's, he's followed my advice. He said he's quit watching so much news, too. Because you know what you do when you watch the news? I don't care which side you're on. You sit there and watch the news, you're going to be upset, and you're going to be you know, tore up, and you're just shaking all the time, just make you angry, you want it? And, I, and that's, that's probably worse on you. <laughs> it's, ha it's hazardous to your health. That's, that's probably worse than what the worst thing might happen. <laughs> Just don't do that to yourself. You keep up a little bit and you sit there and consume that all the time. Man, what if, we, what if, what if every, every Christian put as much time into studying their Bible as they do watching them TV news things? That's how we change the country. Somehow we got it in our heads that we'll change the country from the top down. And the book says, no, we change the country, we change the world from the bottom up, one soul at a time. Instead of making people behave like Christians, and we want them to, but if we're trying to pass laws and force people to behave like Christians, we just need to make more Christians and everything will take care of itself when people exercise their Christianity in, the, in this world, right? And, and, you know, no matter how bad the world gets and no matter how far apart the world may get from this Bible, we say, I'm still a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. 
I'm a citizen of the United States of America, but my primary citizenship is to the Lord Jesus Christ and my home's in heaven. I'm just here for a little while. I want this to be a good society for my kids and grandkids instead of to grow up in, but I'm just here for a little while. I'm, I'm going to vote and I'm going to pray, but I'm going to give my allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I realize that no matter how bad it gets, guess what? I'm still the church and this is my citizenship. I may just, uh, as part of the Christian church, just recognize that uh, as we are, that, that we're just a subculture in the greater culture anyway. Subculture might not be the right word. We're a counterculture. When it comes to the, the darkness and the sin out there, the church is to be a counterculture to that. And we can't make everybody else live like we want them to be the church, but we, we, you know, we want them to. We want the world, to, we want the society to be like a reflection of the church, but realistically we know it ain't like that. We'll do what we can and say, well, we'll be a light to that dark world out here because we're going to live like this book, even if the rest of the world don't, don't live like this book. We can't force them to, to live like that. It's not about a micro. It's, about ma it's not about a macro change. It's about micro change. One soul at a time. <laughs> That's how they did it in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And boy, we get all upset about our society, and we should be. But you know what? You go through the book of Acts and look at the society that Paul and the apostles were, were dealing with back then. And they were living in a society where the, where the government was uh, not subtly anti-Christian, but a government that was uh, just full-blown, we'll, we'll burn them at the stake. We'll throw them to the lines. <laughs> well, what did they do? They went out there and they, they shared Jesus with that world in that society. And we think today, like, well, the society's too bad to go out there and share Jesus with them. It ain't as bad yet as it was in the first century for the Christians. And you know what else I discovered in the book of Acts? That when they went in, out in that society as witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, the church grew like it's never grown before. <laughs> in the midst of all that darkness, people were hungry for the light. People were hungry for the light. So remember, you're not a Christian at church and something else in the other part of your life. You're a Christian that saturates your entire life. Everything you do ought to be filtered through your mind, which is full of the Word of God. And it makes you look at things differently. It don't matter what they tell you out there, what thus saith the Lord. You compare all that too. Everything must be submitted to the Lordship of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I probably spent too much time on this, but Lord, I pray that you spoke to hearts here this morning that uh, as we're living in a time that uh, everybody's going to get all tore up and everything about elections coming up, bullets already flying. Lord, we just pray that the Christian church would realize that, hey, our job is to pray and to vote and be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And no matter what else the, the, the pagan culture out there wants to do, help us to live out our Christianity in this dark world. In Christ's name, amen.